Hello, and welcome to today's video. We're gonna have a fun one today. So, we're gonna be doing a bit of a Q&A, but I've decided to, to get us started, we're gonna ask ChatGPT what health problems it's having, and we're gonna help ChatGPT Chat figure its health problems out. So for those of you that don't know, ChatGPT, I mean, if you're living on, under some kind of rock and you, you don't even know what the internet is, ChatGPT is basically an, an AI, an artificial intelligence, and you can just feed it prompts. And it just comes out, you can literally ask it to write you a novel on anything and it will just do it. You can give it like a three word prompt and it will just create a whole book for you. So I've asked it some questions about health problems that it's struggling with related to the gut health and, and nervous system and trauma and all the, all the cool thing, cool and fun things that we like to talk about. And we're going to be answering some of these questions. So I'm really interested to see, first of all, how we can help an artificial intelligence heal itself. But also, I'm interested to see how much crossover there is between what chat GPT needs and what you need as well. So if any of the questions that I'm answering today seem relevant to what's going on in your life, in your health situation, be sure to let me know. I'd be really interested to hear how accurate this is. So if you do have any questions live or after this, please feel free to leave me a comment, let me know. I'll get back to, I'll get back to everyone and answer all of your questions. So let's get started. So are there any specific dietary changes or supplements that can help alleviate gut related symptoms associated with trauma and stress? Oh, that's a really good one. Okay. So the first place I'm going to go here is we're going to look at root cause. If the root cause of your digestive problem is trauma and stress, the only way you're going to actually fix, fix it, you know, like stop those symptoms from, from originating anymore. The only way you're going to do that is by working at that root cause level and working on healing that trauma and resolving that stress. So for this, I would suggest, okay, this is a really, really, really good one. So the fact that the trauma and the stress is manifesting physically inside the body as digestive symptoms means that the first place I'd be looking at working would be somatics. I'd be working using a somatic based trauma modality so that we can start bringing this somatized emotion out of the physical body. So you can think of this, the, the trauma process as like, so trauma can kind of be defined by anything that happens to you that happens too quickly or it's too overwhelming or it's too much. Your body, your system just cannot handle it. It cannot process it all. And then there's a load of stuff that doesn't get processed and your body kind of holds it. So it's like this emotional stuff that you've experienced. Like think about like maybe a car crash or it can be anything. So much happens so fast your nervous system gets stuck in that state and it, can, it can't leave it. It's like the trauma loop is still open. So what we need to do is we need to feel into the somatic sensations inside your body, which if this is manifesting as digestive problems, if it was from a car crash, maybe you've got a shoulder problem as well. Maybe you have a sore neck. Maybe you've got, uh, everybody has different symptoms, but whatever it is, if the trauma is expressing as a somatic symptom, we need to stay with those, those symptoms and feel them as somatic sensations. And as we do so, the body has its own healing mechanisms. You know, the body is really intelligent. It knows how to heal trauma. It literally knows how to fix itself. We just have to create the right environment. So what we'd be looking at doing would be create an environment where we're just allowing the body to complete the trauma process by itself because it knows how to do this. So we just observe, we just watch, we create space. We allow ourselves to feel physically, somatically, and as we do so, these physical feelings of maybe gut problems, maybe digestive discomfort, maybe pain or discomfort in other areas of the body, this will begin to melt and it will change and it may just go away. But what more often happens, especially as we go deeper in these layers, this physical pain starts to turn into emotional pain instead. And we might start feeling, think about how you'd feel in a, in a car crash. Maybe you feel really scared. Maybe you feel terrified. Maybe you're so terrified you don't know if you're going to live or die. Maybe you're sad because maybe your partner was involved in it. Maybe your children were involved in it or your grandparents or something. So maybe there's other emotions there. Concern. Worry about other people. And, and this, this is a really, really scary thing that can happen as well is say you were coming back from a party where you were having lots of really, like a really good time, lots of positive emotion. This, this trauma loop that has now sealed itself in your nervous system can mean that your body sees 
positive things or like parties, social events as dangerous, as scary. And, it, and therefore, these things actually trigger these symptoms. So your body on a nervous system level now believes if we go to a party, we enjoy ourselves, we have all of these positive emotions, we have connection, we have family, we have friends, we have all of this yummy food, you know, like pizza, beer and alcohol. We do all of these things. Something terrible is going to happen. Something awful is going to happen. My family might die. I'm going to feel terror. I'm going to feel all these overwhelming emotions. And now this is sort of saved. Think about writing this like out as a story in a text document. Now this is saved in your nervous system. And every time you see pizza or every time you go out to a social event, it triggers these things. It activates this, this sort of like pathway in your nervous system and triggers all of these symptoms again. Even though the danger is not really there, it's just because this loop has not closed itself. Your body didn't find closure from this traumatic experience. So we need to stay with it. And as we do, it just completes itself. We just stay with it through that physical process and it just completes that loop and comes back to completion, to wholeness. And then you'll probably feel really tired because you've just, you've just processed all of that. And then you have access to that energy again. And now that wire doesn't fire when you see pizza or when you go out and socialize with friends or spend time with family because it's not in the nervous system anymore. It's discharged. There's no, there's no charge in that, in that situation. So it doesn't happen anymore. And then the root cause is fixed. But what can we do in the meantime? Because that can take time, you know, healing complex trauma, especially something like, so this was a, a more acute event. This was a car crash. What if you've had an experience where you were gaslit your whole childhood or you suffered narcissistic abuse or your, your trauma is not just an acute PTSD. It's more of a complex post-traumatic stress disorder of several smaller T traumas. What do we do that? Well, we need to work on doing this process just a little bit more slowly and it's going to take a little bit more time. But that's the healing process, you know, it takes its own time. So in the meantime, what can we do to support and alleviate gut-related symptoms associated with trauma and stress? So I'd look at the five pillars. The five pillars being the five primary core functions of the digestive system. If you've got any kind of digestive disorder, if you've got any kind of trauma or stress that's affecting digestive function, you can narrow it down into one of these five pillars. You've got stomach acid, digestive enzymes, bile, motility, mucosa. If, if you've got symptoms, it's going to fit into one of these categories and figuring out what, what symptom is an indicator of what, which pillar has been weakened. We can target supplementation based on where you actually need support. So for example, like if you have a digestive enzyme problem, taking betaine HCL as a stomach acid supplement is not going to help you at all because that's not where your digestive system has that weakness. So we need to look at what your symptoms are. And through that symptomat that symptomatic analysis, you determine which of these pillars has been weakened and then target supplementary support based on which pillar needs support. So when we're looking at trauma, universally, without exception, the most common pillar that is affected is motility. And you see this go one of two ways. Either it goes to constipation or diarrhea. And this depends on what the trauma was and how, how, how it was best for you to survive in that moment. If it was better for you to choose fight or flight, then you have generally have a tendency towards diarrhea because your body wants to lighten the load. It just wants to discharge the bowel so that you can have all of that energy to just run or to fight. Whereas if you were in a situation where running or escaping or fighting back wasn't really an option, and this is especially true for more of the complex post-traumatic stress disorders that you get as a child, you know, where you're dependent on your, on your family to survive, you're dependent on your abuser to survive. This instead manifests more as sort of like a freeze response. And just as you're in a freeze response, your whole body shuts down, your colon and your, your whole digestive system shuts down as well. So you've got this stagnation, this lack of movement in the digestive system. Because in the moment, you know, your body doesn't distinguish between being gaslit or a narcissistic parent or some kind of abuse and laying in wait, like trying to hide from a tiger that is chasing you, you know? And if your gut rumbles, if it, if it rumbles and some gas moves around, that tiger might see you and now you're dead. So your gut just turns off. If you're in free, in a free state, your gut just turns off. It's not important. In fact, it can actually cause you to die. So not important. It will just turn itself off. So supporting the, supporting this pillar is actually the most challenging to do through supplements because you cannot really override your nervous system because your nervous system is intelligent. And if it's stuck in a state where it believes that if it activates the digestive system, you're going to die, 
it really doesn't want to activate the digestive system. This is why the whole concept of a root cause focus is so important, because going back to the root cause is actually fixing the problem at the source of the problem. But some other things that you could consider looking at would be probiotics, because probiotics regulate your gastrointestinal motility. They create lots of different compounds. Like, for example, we've got more serotonin in our, in our, in our gut than we do in our brain. And the reason we have so much down there is it, it's a huge factor in regulating your gastrointestinal motility. So what, what happens is when you eat foods, like one of the common ones that people talk about is bananas, because it's very high in something called 5-HTP, 5-hydroxytryptophan. And what happens is this comes into your gut and then your probiotic bacteria, they eat this and then they poop out serotonin, which is what regulates your motility. So if you have a, a flora deficiency, you're going to have a deficiency of the serotonin because this conversion isn't going to take place, which means you're probably going to feel depressed. You're probably going to feel quite sad and it's going to be very hard for you to feel positive emotions. You're probably going to feel constipated and this is going to help with all of them because it's going to help with giving you back that, that molecule that you need for all of these things to function. So that's as far as we're going to go in, in into that question today. So if I have any questions from anyone watching live, please give them to me. I'd love to answer them. I'd prefer to answer your questions than an artificial intelligence's questions because yours are actually going to help you. Artificial intelligence doesn't even have a physical body. So this is not really very useful uh, answers for him. Let's have a look at some more questions. So are there any specific foods or lifestyle habits that I should avoid to support a healthy gut and minimize the impact of trauma on my overall well-being? So I, I think this is a slippy slope kind of question because so the way that it's phrased is, is are there any specific foods or lifestyle habits that I should avoid? This kind of, this kind of, this, this slippy slope is restricting foods that are like potentially inflammatory or maybe like avoiding FODMAPs or cut out the gluten and dairy. And like, this is a really slippy slope where you start cutting things out and then it gets less and less and less and less until you're left with a diet of like, Either you're on carnivore diet or you can tolerate like five or six foods like, like me. And actually at this point, there's potentiality for there to be an eating disorder. And this is really challenging. And if you'd have come to me when, when I was on my restricted diet in those, in those first two or three or four years and told me you have an eating disorder. And actually, in fact, my parents did, my grandparents did, and several friends did. They said, what you're doing looks like an eating disorder. And I was like, no, it's not. Because at this stage, the way that this eating disorder worked was I would eat the foods and I would have a physical reaction. And that makes you think, okay, that's not an eating disorder. You have food sensitivities, you have allergies. It, it can start out that way, but that's but it doesn't stay that way. What, what sort of generally seems to happen is we have so much uh, fear attached to these to these foods. Like for me, like ice cream and pizza. And like, especially like nice foods that bring us pleasure. And the body reacts to them on a physical level with the same level of unsafety that experienced when we actually had physical sensitivities to them, even if they no longer exist. So even if we have moved to a point where our body physiologically is strong enough to be able to digest this food again. So for example, the five pillars are functioning again. We have stomach acid, we have digestive enzymes. We have bile, we have uh, strong motility, we have mucosal function. If all of these things are, are, they don't even have to be perfect, you know, they just have to be like 65, 70%, and then they should be able to handle most foods. But what can happen is we've, we've avoided these foods for such a long time that we now trigger this response through our own, own nervous system. And there's actually no true allergy, there's just actually a fear of these foods. But the fear is so unconscious it's, sum it's somatized. It's a completely physical manifestation. So what this looked like for me was I would eat a food and I would have a physical reaction. Like, so for me, it was my, I would have, I would have terrible gut pain. I would have extreme gut pain. My motility would slow down a lot. So again, this is kind of what we were just talking about earlier is triggering this trauma that I was holding from, from the past when my gut couldn't function. This was an emotional trauma that I was holding. And my, my body was just triggering this, this reaction like it was the, the same things that I'd experienced in the past. However, it was actually just this fear, this fear that I had built up 
from avoiding these foods for such a long time because of how they made me feel. But now it was actually the way that I feel, but expressing in a somatic way as a physical symptom that was actually causing these, these symptoms. So the way that we worked through this and the way that I actually healed this for myself. So just to give you some context, I was eating five or six foods for five or six years, but extremely restricted diet. And I'm now at a point where I can eat literally anything that I want. I just had some lovely Portuguese caldo verde soup, which is like a potato based uh, soup with chorizo in it, which is a very high histamine food and some, it's like the, the name of the name of the soup caldo verde is because of the, the greens that you put in it. It's kind of like kale. It's kind of like a cabbage, kind of like a kale kind of thing. It tastes really nice. And I have these little croutons on the top with gluten in. Like They're like the shittest things you can buy from the supermarket. You know, just on the shelf, not organic, just the just whatever. And I had it and it was delicious. And it was a great dinner. And then I had a bowl of yogurt, high in histamine as well. And I had I had really bad histamine intolerance. And like I feel great. I feel amazing. I feel like I have energy. I have good good focus. You know, I feel I feel healthy. I don't have the same kind of reaction. But the way that we got to this point was through figuring out why I had become afraid of these foods and working through resolving the past conflict. So this looked like, so for me, this was ice cream. And I actually have another video of this. If you go on my YouTube channel, I have a video of me actually doing this, of actually going through this past conflict. So if you want to see it, go and check that out. But just to summarize briefly what this looks like, I had to find all the parts of me that were afraid of eating the ice cream. So it was like, there's a part of me that's afraid that if I have a gut reaction, then I'll starve myself for the next 24 hours because fasting was the only way I could reduce the pain and I wouldn't eat even when I felt hungry and then I'd get so malnourished that I would die. So I told that part, okay, I won't do that. I'll eat even when I feel hungry, even though I have pain. And it was like, okay. And then the next part was like, if you have this gut pain, then you're not going to want to work tomorrow then you're not going to make any money and then you're going to die. So can you see how all of these fears, while they might seem sort of in inconsequential, the end result of them was you're going to die. And my body was responding with that same level of fear that I was going to die. So I was then able to reassure it. Look, okay, I'll just cancel all my work tomorrow. If I have a reaction, it's no problem. I don't have to work. It's okay. And it was like, okay, we're fine with that. And I worked through all of these different conflicts that it had until it got to the point where I was like, okay, even if everything goes wrong, even if we have the worst reaction that we've ever had, we'll be okay. We can take care of ourselves. And then I ate and I didn't have a reaction. And from that point, I've just not had food sensitivities anymore, just like that. And what started as physiological food sensitivities and food intolerances and the inability to digest these foods through this process transitioned into an eating disorder that expressed purely somatically. And I was able to resolve in 24 hours like that. And now I can eat whatever I want. So it really just shows you, I mean, you can say miracles happen. Yeah, it kind of looks like a miracle on the surface, but I know all of the layers that led up to this. And it wasn't a miracle, it was a lot of work. It was a lot of science. There's a lot of understanding of human psychology. There's a lot of understanding of how trauma works. But I've done this, I've seen other people do this too. I've helped them do it. So you can do this as well. This is a totally achievable thing. I'm not special, I'm not unique. Everybody can do this. If this is where you're at and you don't actually know if it's a physiological food sensitivity or an allergy anymore, Maybe we should have a chat and I can help you figure out what your next step is. So any questions? Love to answer them. Moving on to the next one. Let me know if you have any. Let's just have a little look. Are there any, are there any specific relaxation techniques or exercises that can help alleviate both anxiety and gut related symptoms? So I'm actually going to first of all just say there are several apps that you can get now that are they're hypnotherapy based apps and they're, some of them are targeted at IBS. Some of them are targeted at chronic pain. They can be quite helpful with helping you reduce some of this stress and take some of the mind out of what's actually happening. So I think the one that I tried was called Nerva. I think there's also another one called Curable. There are, there are several, you can go on YouTube and just type like, IBS hypnotherapy or, and you'll find, you'll find some apps in the app store. These are good options. I always think that somatic work 
is the best place to start here. And it doesn't maybe sound like I'm flogging a dead horse or I'm, I'm beating the same point over and over again, but I'm saying it because it's really important. I really want to emphasize this, that if, if you are experiencing your symptoms out physically, like if you have physical pain, if you have physical discomfort, then the, the best place that we can start with these kinds of things is physically inside your body, because that's where, that's where it's happening. That's where that, that conflict is, is making itself known to you. And there's so much to learn there. There's so much to learn in the physical body. I've done, I've done some of these sessions with, with, with clients and the internal experience that they have is just phenomenal. There's so much happening inside your own body that you just don't see because you're not really paying there very much attention. So if we just pay a little bit more attention and we look into your pain, we look into your symptoms, we really try to feel them and understand them and explore them, we can find out what they mean and how to take care of them so that they don't have to be there anymore. But what most people do, and this oh, I'm guilty of this myself, and I, it's completely understandable why people do it. If you've had symptoms for a really long time, you probably spend as much time in the day as possible doing whatever it takes to get away from those symptoms because they are stressful, they are overwhelming, they hurt. So you distract yourself with TikTok, with Facebook Reels, with with going on Instagram, with video games, with just anything, anything, Netflix, anything to just to, just to try to get you out of your body, to numb that pain. The thing is, those symptoms, they're trying to call you back into your body because there's something that you need to know, there's something that you need to learn. And your body's trying to give you that message. And it, and I know this kind of sounds funny. And maybe if I'd, I'd, I'd have told myself this, like maybe four, four or five years ago, I'd say, I'd tell myself to shut up. But this is the truth as I've experienced it through my own healing process. And that is that your body really loves you. And it's giving you these symptoms because it cares so much about you that it wants you to see where you're off track. It wants you to see what you're struggling to feel and what you're struggling to process. And it wants you to connect in a more deeper way with yourself. And sometimes that means feeling through your pain before you get to feeling the positive emotions. But I'd actually say more often than not, most people are really good at feeling negative emotions. They're, they're good at feeling anxious. They're good at feeling depressed. They're good at feeling like worried. They're good at feeling the pain and the discomfort because they've been doing it for a really long time. I was the same. And in this case, trauma healing doesn't always look like feeling the pain. Sometimes it's actually feeling the pleasure. Like for me, some of the, the biggest breakthroughs came from seeing how much of a, how, how good of a person I am, seeing how generous I am, seeing how good I am at, at the work that I do. And these were all things that I didn't, I didn't believe. Like one of my most recent experiences was I, I, and I, I didn't know what this, I didn't know that this is how it was supposed to be because it had never been like this for me. Sometimes so you hear people say like, what's your inner dialogue like? And some people say that they have their inner dialogue is horrible and they're always telling themselves that they're bad at things and that they can't do something. And they always, and that was never me. I just never had anything happening inside. There were no negative thoughts. There were just no thoughts there at all. And recently through doing, doing this healing work myself, I started to hear positive mes messages from myself, from my body to me. Like, you're really good at what you do. You do know what you're doing. You are a good man. And to have that now as my inner self talk, it's completely changing my life. You know, you will go so much further when your inner self talk is saying, you're a good person. You know what you're doing. You can, you can help other people. You can change the world. You make a difference. Like if you don't have those things running in the back of your mind, that is a problem. They're supposed to be there. But if you've never had them, you don't know that. And I didn't know that because I'd never experienced it. I know some people have the negative thoughts and they think, okay, maybe they shouldn't be there. I didn't have anything. It was just absence. And I think maybe this is the difference between maybe if you've had abuse, maybe you get this negative self-talk. Whereas if you have neglect or you just didn't get the attention that you needed, maybe you just have this absence and you just didn't get that praise. And you didn't get that reassurance. So now this is starting to return to me and I can be doing something and I, and I want to give up. And I'm like, inside, I, I can hear this inner dialogue from my body and it doesn't always come in words. Your body doesn't always talk to you in words because it's not a words machine, you know? It's more of a feminine communication. It's more body language. You know, it is your body, right? So it's going to talk to you in body language. And sometimes you just get this feeling like you're doing a really good job. You know, maybe you are a bit tired. Maybe you should rest. Maybe you're pushing yourself a bit hard. And it's so soft and it's so gentle and it's so compassionate. And that's where healing really is. You know, you don't, 
push yourself to heal. Just like you can't discipline yourself to like fall asleep. If you lay in bed and try and sleep and you're like, I'm going to go to sleep right now. Oh, I'm so stressed. You just don't sleep. You can't force yourself to sleep and you can't force yourself to heal either. The way that you sleep is you create some structure and then you, you allow yourself to gently fall to sleep. You gently fall into it. And healing is the same thing. You don't discipline yourself into healing. You don't force your body to heal. You gently, softly encourage it into that process. And it, and it happens naturally. And it's a soft, gentle thing. So I don't know how I got here, but that's a bit about my process. That's, that's what it's been like for me. And having that nice, that nice self-talk in the background. Like, so right now my self-talk is, you're really good at authentically and vulnerably, vulnerably expressing yourself in a way that's helpful for other people. That's the self-talk that I have now in the back of my head. And if you've not had positive self-talk, you, you should, and you have work to do that. Because, but again, it's not like, how do I discipline myself into having positive self-talk? No, it doesn't work like that. You have to take care of yourself. You have to allow yourself to, to process and to, to, to heal and to feel. And if currently feeling as an emotion is really hard, then you need to feel as a physical sensation instead. And that's where you start. And that's why somatic work is so important. If you want to try somatic work, let me know. I'd love to do it with you. Cool. Let's do one final question. I haven't had a single question from anybody watching yet. So if you're watching, and I, I see there's nine people there, I can see you. If you have a question for me, give me your questions. I'd love to help you. I'd love to answer your questions instead of just reading them off the ones that I got off of the internet. Your questions are going to be more specifically appropriate to you and I'm going to be able to impart so much more positive impact in your your actual life and that, that's why I'm here you know I'm not just like oh yeah I'll just talk to a camera that's really fun you know I'd rather be like laying in bed like having a nap but I'm here because I want to help so give me your questions so I can answer them and we can get you healing and get your life better because life's supposed to be good so give me your questions okay I'll just check for one more on here but I'm looking I'm waiting for your question so give me that Let me just see. Oh, this is a nice one. Still waiting for your questions, but I'll do this one first. How does chronic stress affect the gut microbiome and what can I do to restore a healthy balance? This is an amazing question. So this, this answering this question, we're going a bit woo woo. So if you're not like open-minded into that kind of stuff, now is, now is probably a good time for you to leave this live stream because this is not for everybody. But there's results here. So if you want to be open-minded enough to give it a shot, then cool, let's try it. So I've found that different organisms have different vibrational frequencies. And if I say the word vibrational frequency and you're like, oh my God, he's lost that. Just hold on for a second, I'll explain it to you. Think about when you walk into a room, you can feel the energy of that room. You can feel if someone's angry. You can feel if everybody's happy in that room. You can feel it. You're feeling the energy. Your microbes can feel your energy. Your microbes can feel your emotional state. And if they don't like your emotional state, they're not sticking around. They're not going to stay. And this works the other way as well. So if you have, for example, like weak boundaries, if you have been, so this is probably you, if you have been subject to any kind of narcissistic abuse, you've been made a victim in, in any situation. Um, it's very hard for you to say, no, you're a people pleaser. This is probably for you. You probably can't say no to pathogens as well. So your gut is probably full of like worms and flukes and parasites and all different kinds of things. And no amount of antimicrobial herbs is going to change that. Nothing's going to change it apart from you reinstigating that energy of being able to say no, being able to have those boundaries again, being able to step into your personal power and, and have that strength. And as you do that, that's going to change the vibrational frequency of your gut. That's going to change what flora is living there. It's going to kick parasites out. You don't have to do a parasite cleanse. Just Get strong boundaries and they will go because your, your, your body, your immune system will say goodbye and it will just remove them. So working that energy has a huge effect there. But two I want to share with you today that are really interesting are the connection between lactobacillus organisms and their emotions and bifidobacterium organisms and their emotions. So if you find that you're intolerant to these probiotics or if you find that you've done like stool testing and these organisms just never colonize your gut no matter how much of the supplements you take, you want to hear this. So I find that lactobacillus organisms are really connected with this boundaries energy, with this 
self-confidence, this self-empowerment. And I'm going to kind of just connect back to something I was saying just a minute ago. If you've spent your whole life being afraid, like I had and still do to a, to a big, a big, uh, a big, a large extent, then you just think that's normal. You don't know what it feels like to feel confident. You don't know what it feels like to feel empowered. You don't know how it feels to be a, a strong person in your own, in your own strength, in your own energy. So you might not even realize that it's missing, but you are supposed to like, like wake up in the morning and you're supposed to have energy. You're supposed to think, how can I help people around me and make loads of money and really enjoy myself and have a fantastic day? And if you don't think that way, and if you've never thought that way, then you should. Like That's what a human experience is supposed to be like. That's what it can be. So if it isn't, then we have work to do that. And this is really hard because you're probably measuring against, you've, you've never experienced this before. So you kind of just settle for what you've already always known. Like I have, I've been afraid my whole life. I had an experience maybe, maybe six months ago where I was walking around outside and I didn't feel afraid for the first time in my whole life. And I was like, oh my God, is this what, this is, this is what normal people are doing. Like this is what it's supposed to be like outside. And normally I'm just like, thinking about what everybody's thinking about me and I'm just like small and just rushing to where I'm getting my heart like beating out of my chest. And I just thought like, this is a normal human experience. But then to experience the contrast to that of actually feeling not just at peace and not afraid, I actually felt really in love with everything that was happening around me. I felt connected with nature. I felt friendly warmth from, from people. And a lot of this like fear, while I didn't acknowledge was fear that I was really afraid, it was also in my body, you know, just just felt constricted. I didn't feel safe. I didn't feel, didn't feel right. And that, that moment was the first time I ever glimpsed it. And it was like, wow, I can never unsee this. I now have something to aim for. You know, this is what I want every day to be like. I don't want to be afraid all of the time. So you might not even realize what you're missing in your emotional state. You might, you may not even realize but if you, do, if you don't, if you know that you struggle with being confident, if you struggle with saying no, if you struggle with having boundaries, if you don't, if you don't have enough money, if you don't have enough of the things that you need, you know, you're struggling to just make it by. This is, this is not the energy that lactobacillus likes. Lactobacillus, lactobacillus likes confidence. It likes certainty. It likes you to believe in yourself. And if you've tried taking them and you react, or if you, they just don't colonize, you probably need to work this emotional side of it because it's really connected. And I've, I've seen these changes myself and with other people. And the other one, bifidobacterium, I find is really connected with love. And I don't just mean like this, like romantic sort of like conceptualization of what love is. I mean like really like true, like, like love, love. And I still ask myself the question like, what is love? It's not something you can intellectualize. It's only something you can feel. But if you've had experiences in the past where the people that you loved the most traumatized you, hurt you in different ways, your perception of what love actually is, is completely warped and you probably have no idea. And it's a process of learning what it is. And you'll probably know this is you because you don't colonize bifidobacterium or bifidobacterium is low in your tests. So again, you might not identify with not knowing what love is on a, on a deep, deep level. But if you struggle with bifidobacterium or bifidobacterium probiotics give you reactions or flare your symptoms up, there's a good likelihood that the bifidobacterium is trying to make that symptom come to you because that symptom is trying to show you how to find what love really is on a really deep, deep level. And there's so much more that goes into it, but these are the most common. These are the ones that I've experienced. These are the ones that I've, I've had the most awareness of because they're the most common. They're the most common types of probiotics. They're the most types of, the most common types of probiotics that people react to. And there's so much to be learned there. So we just have a, one small question. So if you, I'm just doing one little question and then I'm going to finish up and there's 11, I know there's 11 people here. So if you want me to keep going, I need your questions because I'm out. So we had one question just here from, where did it go? Oh, I lost it. I know we had a question though. Oh, this is very hard to read. Okay, GM. Gian, you'll have to let me know if, that, if I'm saying your name right. Gian Davis. Okay, real quick. How do you know if pollen can really affect our gut? So the thing about pollen is it's, it's a part of your environment. 
It's a part of the environment around you. And if your body has developed some kind of allergy to the environment that you're in, you have to ask the question, one, is it the right environment for you? And it might not be, and maybe that means you need to move somewhere else. Or it could mean that your immune system just doesn't feel safe. And if your immune system doesn't feel safe, it's going to react to things that shouldn't really cause it a problem. So on the physical level, we can look at what is causing your immune system to not feel safe. This could be toxins, this can be environmental mold, this can be um, this can be medical treatments, this can be lots of different things. And on an emotional level, do you feel safe? And this is a really good question because if you've never felt safe in your life, if I say, do you feel safe? You're going to say, yeah, of course I do. But if you don't know what that actually really genuinely feels like, you can't, you can't say that you don't feel safe because you don't know what safety actually feels like. And that, again, that was something that I'd experienced too. I didn't actually know what safety felt like. And I'm still only just glimpsing it, you know? It's a, it's a process and it takes its own time. But if you've never felt safe in your life, you probably won't even identify how unsafe you actually feel. You just think that's normal because that's what you've ever experienced. You don't have anything to compare it to. So that is everything for today. Corin, thanks for coming, Corin. She says, you are also my friend. Thanks so much. I really appreciate you. And that's a really nice uh, segue just to finish up today. So Corin is actually from the Healing with William community. So I've got a small, small group. I say small, we're up to about 41 members now, 42 members of like-minded people, just like myself, that are working through, through their own healing process. We do Q and A's every three times a week. So this one today is kind of gives you an example of what we're doing. This is a, on video. I don't always do it on video. Sometimes I do it just as, as text, but we do three Q and A's a week. We have one class every Sunday. So, so far the classes that we've done, we did a root cause. Uh, we did a workshop on root cause and uh, we went over lots of different lab testing. So people submitted their lab testing in and we went over it as a group trying to figure out like, what do these markers mean? What do these, what do these readings mean? What is your likely root cause? We did a big Q and A on there. We also did a trauma workshop where we did some of the, the first stage of the Illumina method, which is my, uh, my emotional healing method that I've, that I've put together over the years. We started with some somatic work. So if you liked what I was saying earlier about somatics, come along. We've got a guided meditation in there. We're going to be doing at least one of those every single month. It's a really amazing, it's a really amazing technique. And we're looking at taking those, those uh, exercises and, and chopping them up and making just just exercises so you can repeat them yourself outside of the outside of the trainings. We've got a group chat. We're literally talking like 24 seven. It's one of the, the most info dense places I've ever seen. You know, I feel like sometimes, and I'm not hating on them, but sometimes Facebook groups, they're not the best source of information because it's just people regurgitating things that they've heard other people say, or they're just saying things that they've, they've read on the internet. This group is actually people talking about their own personal experiences, what has actually made a difference for them, what has actually changed their lives, supplements that they've taken, therapies that they've tried. We literally have so much cool stuff going on in there. So if you're interested in like nervous system work, there's lots of people in there that have got mold or mold sickness, COVID stuff. If you've got any kind of gut problem, this is the place that you want to be. You know, it is, it is the group. It is the place to be for, for healing in 2023. So if you want to join, just leave it, leave me a comment or send me a message. We would really love to have you. So that's everything for me today. I hope you found this really helpful. And if you do have any questions after I finish, please let me know. And I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.